So what about the AI approach? I think everyone over here, even in India as well, is aware of hybrid. So what is hybrid actually? So it tends to combine the two different approaches. So I think uh, after a lot of comprehensive and wonderful talks, we all know why, what is atrial fibrillation and why we are talking about atrial fibrillation. Not only it increases the risk of stroke, dementia, heart failure, but it's also an independent risk for increasing the morbidity and also the mortality. So if we can see in this slide, the prevalence rate for the atrial fibrillation or even flutter may not be as high as per peripheral vascular disease, but when we try to see for the mortality and the morbidity, it is definitely very, very high. So as it was already pointed out by Dr. Rohit already, prevention is better than cure. So one simple question for the audience over here, what do you think is the cheaper treatment for atrial fibrillation? Is it antiarrhythmic drugs? Is it catheter ablation or is it defibrillation? So most of the people, especially the common man, may still think that the drugs are the cheapest, but it doesn't seem to be gaining any scientific evidence. As we can see, at the end of almost two years, the costs for both of them tend to be similar. And in fact, since 2014 as well, Andre Natale is said to be one of the legends of EP. He's the head of Texas Heart Institute. So they all have been also trying to propagate that antiarrhythmic drugs are definitely outmoded and catheter ablation should be the first line uh, therapy. And I always try to say, wherever if I go, I always say time is muscle. Rohit Walia has already wonderfully uh, taught us all as well. If you give them time, the paroxysmal is going to land up into persistent, persistent into permanent. And this way, literally, you're denying your patient, denying that person a, a door to better quality of life. So there were some studies which had already been telling the success rate is in early 50s, but at this date, when we are standing in 2017, India is thinking of sending a human mission to moon and Mars mission as well, maybe humans as well. So right now we can offer more than 80% of success rate in fact. Even with the single cryo balloon as well, there are more than 13 studies alone which can give a success rate of 18%. And of course, one of my favorites is number 13 study, uh, in which this was the one in which we tried to compare the cryo balloons with the laser balloons in fact. So we do need to understand a little bit pathophysiology, and there is also electrical remodeling which is happening. And of course, one of the proven methods, especially to attempt a persistent atrial fibrillation using a RF catheter is stepwise approach. So stepwise approach initially is always to try to target the pulmonary veins. After that, still you should, if you are able to induce, then try to go to the most common source, extra pulmonary vein source, which is SVC. After that, try to see in the coronary sinus. Then after that, go to the posterior walls. And then after that, maybe a CTI or met a mitral line, in fact, as well. So one another simple question as well, that when we are thinking, what is the modality which gives maximum or the highest success rate? Is it catheter ablation, coxmase, or antiarrhythmic drugs? I think even in... Till date, we might agree that coxmas is the one which gives maximum success rate with even excellent long-term results. So what if we can translate those ablation lines in a catheter-based therapy? And this is what is the beauty of the hybrid ablation is it tends to mimic the surgical lines in a minimally invasive way. So it tends to put together the advantages of the cardiologist and the cardiac surgeons. And of course, doing away with their disadvantages. So it always starts with the surgical dissection started by the cardiac surgeon, doing a transeptal puncture, then start with the heparinization, and the stepwise approach, which is followed by the surgeons, is doing a pulmonary vein isolation, then making the roof line and the mitral line. And finally, then the electrophysiologist enters, and then trying to see like this. So this was one of the earliest models. I was uh, asked to prepare at my uh, lab as well, trying to test the safety and feasibility of the hybrid model. Does it exist well? And this is the one in action. So I was lucky to share my results with Professor Jeffrey at NEJM as well. 
um, its office in uh, the Harvard Medical School. And I think uh, I'll try to show you some of the case results as well. So as you all know, AF and COPD aggravate each other, which makes the treatment as well very worse. Morbidity and mortality associated with this disease is very awful. So at our center as well, we had a subset of more than seven patients. As we can see, the COPD status for them was more than class four. They all really had a very long AF duration. They were pretty obese patients as well. So this is how initially the patient, you have to put it up, the setup like this. So initially the cardiac surgeon goes, put up the ports and the interports. You start doing the pericardial dissection. And then, so we have to also do the angiogram, pulmonary venous angiogram to visualize the pulmonary veins. And then after the surgeon has already made the lines, then we enter. So at our center, we were lucky to have cryo balloons as well, uh, past, uh, cryo, in fact, more than 11 years. We were having la the laser balloon as well. We were also having the radio frequency. So we were thinking, what shall we do? And uh, we all know the, what happens is the most common side effect with the cryo balloons is right-sided phrenic nerve paralysis. So with the available exper expertise, we had a discussion was only for the left side, we will use the cryo balloon, but for the right side, we'll use the surgical ablation. And why we had to do it like this was, being COPD patients, if you will put them for complete general anesthesia, you will be knocking out their lungs as well, and the oxygen stats will definitely start dipping and it would be a problem. And that's the reason we try to do was freeze on one side, ablate on the other side. So it was literally combining fire and ice together. And this is how the tools look like, the epicardial tools, as we can see it over here, the catheters, and then the endocardial catheters, in fact, as well with the sheath, which you all can look. And this is the diagrammatic representation of the ablation lines. So on the left side with the cryo balloons, and on the right side, so this is the SVC line, the line connecting the cable line, then this is the box lesion, and the left-sided MTI line. So at the end of three years, out of seven patients, we had more than six of them, almost six of them were in sinus rhythm, but one of them needed a redo catheter ablation. So we were also trying to investigate the safety and feasibility of the watchman implantation as well. So I think the results are expected very soon to be coming out. The other thing as well we all need to remember is the way in which a cardiac electrophysiologist looks at the pulmonary veins or the ablation procedure as well is slightly different. Our, the surgical view as well is slightly different. And as I had said it, there are some pros, there are some cons as well. So the pros, the best part of the endocardial approach is we do have a mapping device. We have very good standard electroanatomical or electrophysiological endpoints like the entrance block, the exit block, the pacing maneuvers, in fact, or we can still give the endocardial touch-ups. But of course, it takes a lot of time as well. It needs virtual mapping system, in fact, and you may still injure the phrenic nerve or even the esophagus. And as we all know that the surgical lines are wonderful. They have a very long-lasting endurance as well. This is one of the pictures, how you visualize. And this, these are the patients, so for example, if we all can notice it over here, so in the initially before the procedure, you can see really fragmented, sharp pulmonary vein potentials, which they all eliminated after the ablation, in fact. So this is in the right superior pulmonary vein. The growing concept has been about ablation of these not only cafes, but also the autonomic ganglias as well. But what happens is when you try to apply those clamps, especially close to the pulmonary veins, because they all are in the close proximity of the application site, they all also tend to disappear over time. And uh, so initially I remember when I had joined over there way back in 2010, some of the procedures they used to start by 9, 9.30 in the morning, they used to go up till 4 o'clock, even 5 o'clock as well in the evening. Even for cryo as well, uh, I'll show you my, uh, I would say my guru. So they used to say, even for atrial fibrillation, I'm talking like eight or nine years back. So they used to start early in the morning, 
it used to go up till like seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the evening. So because it was all focal touch-ups and at, at each and every point, you have to hold those cryocatheters for four minutes. My first it, um, CTI line, which I made, was with a cryocatheter. And with that, every point you have to keep on holding so you can literally go and sip your water, you can have your coffee, everything as well. So, but of course, uh, as we can see, uh, in the end, I'm talking like two, since 2014 onwards, the procedure time decreased to less than 30, uh, like just three hours in fact. And the hospital stay is like uh, not more than five days. And this is how the chest of the patient looks like after the patient has recovered. And we also shared our results in Jack, and uh, we had really wonderful results. Even for the persistent, in fact, we had a slightly higher results, in fact. So we all have been taught one plus one is 11, isn't it? What if we can add some newer technologies to this already very wonderful hybrid ablation? So we try to see the safety and feasibility of using contact for sensing catheters for this. And we also saw it, there's a very similar mechanism for both the procedures, in fact, as well. So what was happening is not only we were able to predict the gap formation, we reduced the ablation time, and also overall procedural efficacy also improved with this. So why, what is the role for contact force catheters? So we saw like this, not only if your contact is not good, the lesion which you make is inadequate, inadequate, the thrombus formation risks are more, the catheter tip charring may happen, or steam pop formation, and even cardiac perforation as well. So this was one of the studies in which we tried to test that with how much grams, how better is the lesion set, in fact. So we all already saw it like this. If you maintain a good and adequate contact uh, lesion, your transmurality of the lesion will also be really wonderful. And uh, when you try to visualize all these things, you can also start picking up a lot of problems as well. So this was one of our case reports as well in which we could even visualize the pulmonary vein stenosis, which had happened. So the patient had come for hybrid ablation and then already the patient had undergone catheter ablation. So this arrow tends to show the pulmonary vein stenosis, and the, this is the CT as well. And this was another patient after laser balloon ablation. The patient had developed pulmonary vein stenosis, and in fact, hybrid ablation also is not full of uh, success-only stories. There are some problems as well. This was one of the patients I had diagnosed, a patient with uh, lung hernia, in fact. This is a three-dimensional reconstruction. This is what is called as the hybrid room in which the cardiac surgeons and even the cardiologists as well tend to work together for such kind of patients. And this is my guru, like uh, Dr. Carl Timmermans. And he had been with uh, Rodriguez, uh, Mario Rodriguez. They had been working since the initial days of cryo, uh, right from the early morning. The case will continue up till six or seven o'clock. And working with the other colleagues as well. So uh, one question was there, how can we predict so we always have to work on our fundamentals. And how do we work out? We need to know the P wave formation is due to the different sections of the heart. And what are they is, for example, the late activation of the left atrium contributes to the pulmonary vein region, which is representing the baseline terminal part of the P wave. And the myocardial sleeves or the pulmonary veins tend to contribute to the middle portion of the P wave and that is the reason when you electrically isolate a pulmonary ve vein, it will even alter you, uh, the P wave duration, in fact. And this was one of the papers in which I wrote an editorial. So the paper had come with, can you try to see for the Doppler method methodology to predict atrial fibrillation recurrence as well? I was not so convinced. And I said it, the, uh, the main reason is because this is an angle-based technology. And that was one of the reasons as well, not yet it has found its place in the standard recommendations. I was lucky uh, to work with this uh, Italian mathematician, Pedro Bonizzi, with whom we can formulate a newer mathematical model 
to predict or evaluate and study in details the P wave. And if we can predict the ablation procedure success rate or even the failure rate as well. So we try to study this, especially the hybrid ablation, uh, in terms of uh, can the shortening, uh, how much the P wave duration has shortened, can it predict? And we saw it, yes, we can. Especially for the persistent AF patients, definitely yes. And a lot of our complaints, especially in India, I always come across as they say, oh, AF ablation is such a costly thing. Can't we use simple things as well? I think, yes. The simple things, even like adenosine as well, has a big role. And what is the big role uh, can we do for this? So what tends to happen is once you inject the adenosine, the resting membrane potential of these pulmonary veins will go slightly above the resting membrane potential, or which is the firing threshold. And that is the why you can see these transient pulmonary vein potentials, so which is called as dormant reconduction. So this was the other image as well, which I had shown. Normally with the radio frequency or even with the cryo balloon as well, we had observed you can see the dormant reconduction in 15 to 20%. But with the hybrid approach, surprisingly, we saw the reconduction was present only in 1%. And why is it? Because there was better transmural lesions, and that is the reason why we expect so much good success rate as well with this. And in fact, this is the AT adenosine testing after second generation of cryoballoon ablation in which we try to see the adenosine versus non-adenosine effect uh, as well, and we saw it as well, definitely it tends to affect the success rate. And in fact, this was the paper which was asked by the Lancet for me to review for the advice uh, trial as well. And of course, advice trial came and ATSCA, my uh, paper has been quoted in the 2017 HRS AHRA guidelines for the catheter and surgical ablation for the 2017 guidelines as well. So this was my previous home center. So to conclude, hybrid ablation definitely tends to combine the best aspects of the epicardial and endocardial ablation techniques. It's a wonderful, safe procedure as well with very good, not only acute, but also long-term success rate as well. So thank you so much for your patience, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.